Good afternoon, uh, good morning and good evening wherever you are in the world and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live with me, Louise Brogan and my very lovely guest, Esther Kish, who is joining us from Florida today. Esther is uh, the head of Born to Influence and she helps people who want to get their message and their brand out in front of literally millions of people. I'm very excited to have her as my guest today. So welcome along, Esther. Thank you so much, Louise. So fun to be here. Yes. So tell a little bit. Uh, so the podcast for my weekly podcast listeners was supposed to come out Wednesday. Completely my fault. It came out this morning. So hopefully people have had a chance to check in and listen to what you and I are talking about. But for those who uh, just join me on LinkedIn normally and don't check out the podcast, Esther, could you introduce yourself a little bit and tell everybody what you do in your business? Yeah, I'm the most curious person in the world, probably. <laughs> Went from thing to thing for a while, and I, I imagine I still will do that for, for some time. But for the past eight years, I've been working with entrepreneurs, coaches, consultants, speakers, authors, helping them get in the media. And that means both traditional media, so TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, and then also online media, podcasts, YouTube shows, Facebook Live interviews, stream yards, LinkedIn Lives, like all the things. So yeah. what we are looking for is how can we get them in front of the right audiences, relevant audiences, both where they would get really a high level of credibility just because of the brand names of those media outlets, mm -hmm. and also with uh, with maybe not as much brand name, for example, podcasts that you don't wouldn't know or the average person wouldn't know the name of the show but yeah. it's the perfect audience for them where they get a lot of leads and sales yes so it's more about getting very specific with each client and who they want to get in front of rather than somebody coming along and, and declaring to you that they want to be you know on on a specific tv show and you're like well that that's not really where your audience are. So you work with people on that. Yeah, definitely. We have an in-depth conversation and make sure that we are aligned and their expectations are also what we can deliver on. Because, you know, if somebody only wants to be on Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss, it's not going to work. <laughs> if those are the only two that they're interested in, like probably it's not going to be enough. Even if we get it, it's not enough momentum because, yeah. you know, you need the repetition to be out there consistently. Yeah, so it's interesting because um, my regular watchers and listeners will know that I've been working away on my YouTube channel. I'm, I'm putting out two video, two like tutorial type videos every week on that at the minute. And uh, some people I've been hearing say, you know, until you have 150 videos on there, don't start to panic that you're not building a presence on there because you need like the whole swathe of content on there. And it's the same kind of idea. You can't just go on one podcast and think that's it. That's yeah. going to bring me my business. So it's a yeah. kind of similar idea, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And the thing is that even one podcast can literally make you tens of thousands of dollars. It just depends on what the offer is, how good of a fit that audience is to what you're interested in, and how personable you are when you share what you do. That, that's a big part of it too, is how do you share that message? Yes. Oh, that's, that's so true, actually, because we tend to, we buy from people, don't we, at the end of the day, the people that we like and people that we resonate with. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, so do you think, going off back, back of that, actually, Esther, do you think then that video can be the, a stronger um, media for some people then? It's very important to do video as much as you can. And I, it's funny because back in 2013, when we started our podcast with my friend Meta Miller, there was no HD video. YouTube had the 480p, like that really low resolution thing. And still we did our interviews on video using Google Hangouts, even though the technology was not set up for it. Because I just find it so important to, even between the host and the guest, to have that connection, the mm -hmm. rapport that you can build by having those visual cues and understanding how intensely the person is listening to you or what their feeling is. Maybe they're not quite quite clear on something whatever it may be it's so that you can really go in depth with what would be relevant in that conversation mm -hmm. and so that's one part of it the other part of it is that now it's actually easy because you would be hard-pressed to find even a laptop that doesn't have a built-in webcam yeah. you know like, so so the technology is there for most people who are in this space yes. and uh if you think about it most podcasters now who podcasts used to be audio only typically now they've added a video 
video component. They might be doing an accompanying live like you're doing here, or maybe they're doing it where they're doing the whole recording on Zoom, and then the video portion will be shared on social media and the audio goes on Apple Podcasts. Mm -hmm. Then in a, on the traditional media side, actually magazines like Forbes and Inc or even websites like Medium, they love when you can enrich the content and add video there. So that's a big plus. Then when you look at TV, just with COVID, now producers are really looking to interview as many guests as possible not being in studio. So having the ability to do it on Zoom or Skype actually gives you a lot more opportunities because before you would have to travel. And so that would limit you to the local area where you live, or you would go somewhere where you're doing business anyway, and then be interviewed on that TV station locally there. But now you can do it from home. So the whole country is open. So video is, is really something that we can use as a very powerful tool. Yes. Do you think then because of that, do you advise clients about the setup, like literally the setup behind them and their video. I so say if, if they were going to get an opportunity and they were going to be interviewed on video, do you talk to them about what, what the background of where they are should look like? Uh, occasionally, yes. Most of them are already pretty savvy in this. They've been doing content marketing for a while, so they would look decent. You know, it doesn't have to be something very fancy. What I do advise against, and I've never had any client, but occasionally I see it from, from people who do this, is the green screen backgrounds. It's mm -hmm. the technology is just not there yet, at least for live video. And it tends to be where you move around and then you know, <laughs> right. your body disappears or the whole thing is this liquidy. <laughs> and even if it's like really, really well done from a technological perspective, it still looks fake because you yeah. you can see the lighting, the shadows are different. It's like, don't, don't bother. Like, you know, like I, I got the little flower there, a little lamp and then <laughs> good enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny actually, because, uh, it's really off-putting. Now, not in when I'm talking to clients on Zoom, so most of my um, the work that I do face-to-face -face people on Zoom, apart from the LinkedIn Live shows that I do on here, um, the anytime I'm talking to somebody and they've got those background, the green screen backgrounds, it's usually a client, and it is so off-putting when they move, yeah. and that part of them fades in and out of the pixels or something. Um, but also, I've been caught out <laughs> once or twice where I've said oh, it's really gorgeous where you live. It's really beautiful. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. Really but that's the other thing that most of the time it's really well intended. People want to make it so that it's more visually interesting, but you got to think about why am I doing this video? I want people to pay attention to me and my content, not to look yeah. at how pretty the nature is behind me. And then depending on how it's set up, like some people have a drop cloth, like an actual fabric that the thing is projected to, and then that is not iron, it's all wrinkles. <laughs> it looks all out of whack, it's terrible. <laughs> Just forget it for now at least. You know, if, if you really wanna play, I I will say this, if somebody really wants to play with green screen, and I've done green screen projects because I used to be an actor, so that's like a whole different thing. Oh you can goodness. make it very beautiful, <laughs> But you need a lot of space, the proper and skilled, you know, lighting and all of that. So if you want to play with it, go into a studio, learn how they do it professionally and see mm -hmm. if you have the room at home to replicate it if you really, really must. But yeah. for the most part, it's, it's just better not to. Yes. Actually, I know that in, in Belfast, where, where I live, I do know that some um, video organizations last year when they were or when, whenever all the in-person conferences got cancelled and went online instead, there were video studios that you could go and hire out for a couple of hours so that you had the proper background and setup. And I thought that was a really smart move, actually. Exactly. Hmm. So you can be resourceful, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, talk to me about some of the people that you have worked with um, in the past that some of the LinkedIn audience would, would recognize, Esther, and what kind of... You know, let, let's talk about what kind of results you've got for people because I, I got this line off your website and I just love it. Like mm -hmm. I just, I mean, who doesn't want to start <laughs> business? Yeah, yeah. Tell, us, tell us a couple of stories about people that you've worked with and what kind of um, media you've been able to get them. Definitely. So I've been really fortunate and been able to work with some really big names, New York Times bestselling authors. One person who comes to mind who most people here would recognize is Gary Vaynerchuk. I worked on his last book for um, Ask Gary, for the Ask Gary V book. Yeah. And it was interesting because I've known him for like five years prior to that. I interviewed him on my podcast uh, back in 2013. And back then he had another book, Jab, 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 Right Hook. And it was just the timing, I guess, like in part it was luck and also, obviously, we are taking the initiative to reach out to him. But um, 
he committed that year to do every single show and every single podcast that he could get on. Yeah. And so he was really like, he already had a New York Times bestselling book prior to that, the Crush It book. But this one was like, okay, I really want to blow it up. And so that work ethic and that attitude of not being too school, too cool for school, right? He already had a multi-million dollar business, like hundred tens of millions of dollars with a mm -hmm. wine business, right? So it's not like he needed necessarily the exposure to position himself as an expert, but mm -hmm. he knows where he he knew where he wanted to go. And I feel like there is a lot to learn from that too. That mm -hmm. don't ever like don't waste your time when the baby shows, all right? But but at the same time, just make sure that you are putting in the effort that's required. Yes. And so that that was how I first met him. And then a few years later we both spoke at a conference and I knew that he mm -hmm. has a new book coming out, uh the Ask Gary V book. And I asked him that well I could help you with the publicity side of this. And granted he already had a big team, you know, six hundred people at the time who was work who were working for him. Wow. So it's not like he needed an additional person but but I knew that I have the connections because at that point I've been already doing this for years and and his strategy was unique in that it's not something that necessarily most people in the audience here would be exactly able to replicate purely because he already had that cachet and that following and so with him what we were able to do is to get interview opportunities where the host would commit to buying a certain number of books in exchange to interview him. And so they could give it away to their audience. So it was real, you know, it was proper purchases to individual readers, but still, you know, like you would buy 500 books or a thousand books or whatever it was, you know, for having, depending on the length of the interview. And then we also uh, got him on some speaking uh, stages where it was like even more because of the number of attendees. So that that is really something that you can try and replicate, but just understand that it's more of a building rapport and relationships with those people yes. if you're not quite at that level of fame yet where people are vying to buy that many books or maybe you do smaller books and you do five books ten books like smaller bundles that, that could be something that you can try and replicate so that was something where we sold and and he made the new york times list obviously with that book as well and then another person who comes to mind, actually, I'm going to give you two more examples, just real quick. Okay, it's, like, it's a good range because this is like the, the top, 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 like somebody who was already, who had very much traction. I, I'll give you someone who was who is very good and has been very good in their business, but they didn't have an online presence in the sense of media. And then somebody who had zero online presence. So the second example who comes to mind is Ryan Levesque, who I work with him on both of his book for, books for Ask and for Choose. And Ryan uh, had developed this methodology that he wrote the book about and, on market research and the survey funnel methodology. Um, he had sold over $150 million worth of products and services before he wrote the book. So he really wrote from experience, but he he did like a few interviews here and there, but not a lot. And so over the course of about 11 months, we booked him on 80 shows and ended up making the bestseller list, of all the national all the national bestseller lists, except for the New York Times, like Wall Street Journal, LA Times Today, Publishers Weekly, all of them. It was the number one book in Amazon, like not in a subcategory, like all books in Amazon. Wow. We sold over 50,000 copies in the first year. And we ended up adding over $1.8 million per year to his business because mm -hmm. of this. And we know because he tracks it with the coupon code, you know, he would know exactly what show brought what. And the last example I want to give you is my client, Akshay Nanavati, who literally didn't even have a Facebook page yet. Like he didn't even have a public Facebook page, zero online presence. And so we worked together with a friend of mine who owns a marketing agency and they've built his funnel and his ads and the offer and all of that. And, and I did the publicity on this. So we got him on all the different TV networks, a lot of podcasts. He is a hustler as well. So he, he actually was so committed to his project. He got the Dalai Lama to write the foreword for it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we sold books where now he's selling in 40 different countries and he's uh you know investors and investing in his projects and mm -hmm. uh, philanthropists are, uh, are contributing to his nonprofit. so absolutely anything is possible as long as yes. you you just are strategic and allow for enough lead time i think that that's one thing that people need to keep in mind too is that it's not going to happen overnight you need at least a few months up to a year depending on what kind of platform you already have and what is the project size that, that you want to go after Yes. So if you have uh, if you have something that you're planning on launching, like a book or something or program that you need to really think about and plan out strategically in advance before before. Yes. Yeah, that, yeah, I love that. Um, those are such great. I love those stories, Esther. They're really they're really excellent. 
And what um, I find really fascinating about when I interviewed you for the podcast and, and how you operate is that you don't miss any detail. You are, you've got every single little box, possible box check that I, some of them I haven't even thought about. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about conferences that I've been to in the UK and exactly what you're saying. So speakers who are on stage at the conference and they bring along a big box of their books. Yeah. And they give out those books to people. Like they'll say on their talk, if you want to see me afterwards and come over, I've got, you know, I've got 10 copies of my book with me and they come off stage and people are all like rush over. To yeah. get them. And then of course that creates a real buzz around the book and then other people want to get it. And I love this, this concept. So do you think um, that for a lot of people who want influence, do you think that having a book is a really important part of that? It's an amazing addition. It's not a requirement. I will say that. And like, I feel like I might write a book myself someday, but you know, I'm in, the, in this space for eight years now and I still haven't done it. So, and, and still was able to get all the media and all kinds of different TV and everything. Yeah. So um, it's not a requirement. It does help. Uh, and yeah. the best thing that you can do is to really pay attention to your market and to figure out what are some of the things that they are, they're thinking about the conversation in their head. What are some of their concerns? Mm -hmm. What's the psychology? What are the emotional struggles that they have that cause these questions to come up or these struggles to come up and to speak to that through your stories? And when you're giving actionable advice, like how you were saying earlier that sometimes I cover things that you didn't even think about that that would be an issue. Like that's the thing that understanding that we don't know what we don't know, right? So if somebody was not in this world, like how would they know that you have to plan four to six months in advance if you want to be in a bigger podcast? Because that's just how competitive it is and yeah. how much in advance they line up guests. So if if you know if your book is coming out next month, it's a little late to plan a podcast tour. I'm, I'm not saying not do it, but just understand that either you push it back, which is most of the time that's not the wise thing to do, mm -hmm. then except that it's not going to be if if you only walk up a month before like it's not the time where you're going to ramp up a bunch of pre-orders it's just yeah. too late but what you can do is have the slow burn kind of ongoing promotion and there is nothing wrong with that it's just a different strategy yes oh this is so good oh we've got a comment from somebody who is joining us okay Narciss hi Louise and Esther can some of the PR be done DIY or would you need an would would you need an agency for the agency's connections I think you're saying Narciss Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I know what I think about that. I think you can do a bit of a DIY, but once you actually invest a bit of money with somebody like Esther, I think it would take off. But I'm going to let you answer that properly, Esther. Sure, sure. Well, it, it's, it really depends on where you're at, right? And nurses, thank you so much for asking this question. This is something where you got to think about where is your time best spent? Mm -hmm. Because if you are still at the stage where you're still like ramping up and not maybe sales are not consistently coming in or it's like kind of like at the beginning stages of a business, maybe you're not in a position to hire an agency. Because I will tell you right now, it's it's not cheap. OK, so if you hire someone for a few hundred dollars a month or something like that, because there are those kinds of offers, you're just not going to get the results. And then you might as well save that money, put in the time and effort to develop your own relationships. Mm -hmm. And once you get to a level, like, say, half a million dollars a year and up is where it makes sense to hire a, a publicity agency because they would have the understanding of exactly what type of shows and media outlets to go after for your specific goals and the personality that you have and, and everything that you want to have in place to make this campaign successful mm -hmm. and also they have the relationships so this is it's it's a funny thing but like i've had clients where they tell me that i've been trying to get on this show and five times already they rejected me and i send an email and they're on it's and it's not guaranteed but sometimes it happens that way just because they trust the recommendations to the degree where i have calendar links of podcasters where they tell me that just book them in like don't even bother to pitch book them in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never actually took advantage of this, but it, I just take it as a real honor. They really trust the recommendation. So that's the advantage of working with someone who has been in this space for a while and they have those relationships. But if you're not at that revenue level yet, I would recommend that you 
put in the, the time and the effort to really put together a list of what would be the right shows. And then what you can do is plan out, start building those relationships, ideally before you start pitching yourself so that there is a human connection. And then every time you book an interview, once you're done, at the end, ask that, how do you feel, right? Whether you're a host or a guest, that's a great question to ask once you stop the recording, how do you feel? And the person is gonna give you a little bit of feedback. Wow, when you talked about this, this was so good. It, it's gonna really help our, uh, our audience, or maybe this is something that I wish we could have gone into more detail about. And then that gives you the opportunity to potentially book a follow-up interview. And mm -hmm. you start having that kind of like, uh, you know, guards down kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask that, by the way, these are really cool topics for, for your audience. I really enjoyed it. I would love to contribute more in the future. And in the meantime, I'm looking to get on some more shows. Do you have someone who you who you would recommend, who it would be worthwhile? And you ask for those referrals and get those introductions. And then that way you're building your network very, very quickly. Oh, you are giving us some solid gold here. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> That's excellent. Narciss, so, Narciss, I'd like to know, um, have you tried to pitch yourself or have you considered um, working with somebody in PR to get yourself more? Let, tell us tell us a wee bit more about that. Um, and anybody else that's watching as well, we, wanna, we want you guys to come and interact and ask us questions. Um, but that's so interesting. So there would be, I, I, I mean, from, oh yes, that's what I wanted to ask. If you were working in a particular industry, then Esther, would there be, oh look, Narcissus' comment. Amazing, <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> um, so if you were, say you were working as a consultant for women in sports, for example, would it make sense that if you went to work, if you wanted to hire an agent or an agency to work with you, that you would try and find one that's specialized in that area? Or, you know, does it, is it, can it get that niche or not? Um, there are some agencies and some publicists who specialize that much in a particular type of industry. I don't know that it's always necessarily something that you need. It would depend on a case by case basis of what it is. Like as an example, if you are working with someone in the art world, that's really a little bit, you know, like hoity toity, and, and you really need those relationships there. So you would be better served with somebody who specializes in that, right? Or sometimes I get requests from people who want to, who are actors or in the entertainment industry. I tell them that that's just not something that I'm really able to help with. I can work with experts, but then within the experts, quote unquote, space or industry, like whether you're a health coach or a uh, business coach, or you have something like a software product that helps entrepreneurs and it's built based on your expertise, mm -hmm. That, that's still the expert, like I know how to pitch that kind of thing. So you don't necessarily have to be topically that niche, but with the sports, I mean, I, I would imagine it would probably help to have someone who specializes in that niche because they have their own special kind of reporting and, and that would, and if you don't know anything about sports, like I don't, I would not take on a project like that because I don't know <laughs> enough. I don't know too much about sports personally either. <laughs> Excellent, oh, that's really so good. So, um. Tell, tell us a little bit how you, so we mentioned that you're, you start, did you start your podcast in 2013, Esther? Yes. Yeah. We yes. started, we, we took six months to launch. Like we were pre-recording so many interviews, which is one of the biggest mistakes I think I, I've made, but it made sense at the time because uh, my co-host Meta lived in Tanzania. So we had a 10 hour time difference. And so we had to coordinate between her time and my time and the guest time. And then meanwhile, I was still working as the director of marketing at a, at a jewelry company. So it was like, you know, it had to be outside of my job hours and work with everybody's schedule. And so we thought that because it's just so logistically hard to coordinate it all, it's better if we have a lot of shows booked in advance and recorded yes. in advance. And also because it was a daily show, Monday through Saturday. So we pushed back six months before <laughs> we actually launched. And I think about it, like it basically means like it would be six months ahead of where I am right now. <laughs> well, not really because, you know, things happen, but still <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we, we took a long time, but it started in 2013. Mm, and would you recommend, so, I mean, I obviously have a podcast, um, but would you recommend in 2021, oh, sorry, I'm just bringing up Narcissus' comment, hasn't done much PR other than workshops, talks mm -hmm. and workshops here and there, so. Time um, to get started. <laughs> yeah, it's time to get started, Narcissus. Um, so, you know, do you think if, you know, do you think starting a podcast in 2021 is a good idea for somebody who wants to get out there a little bit more or a video show or what would you know, what would your be advice be and does it, do you think it depends on industry again 
I, I would recommend to do video if you can. You don't have to use it. That's that's what I was telling you earlier that we started with video back in 2013. It was really not uh, the it was very forward thinking at that time. <laughs> but uh, what, what I can say is that right now, it would be nice if you can use something like StreamYard, like we are using right now, or Zoom or something to that effect. Because even if you don't want to edit the video, you don't have the time or the skills, you still can just strip the audio, put it out as a podcast, and then take small little bits of it as teasers, like little segments that you can share on social media. Because mm -hmm. video is just treated better by search engines than, than audio. So if you're looking to really grow your platform having that advantage of having visual content is good and then at the same time you can also make it so that because you have the video you can do the the subtitles there or the cap, the caption thing and so people when they're scrolling on their news feed and they come across one of those little segments if they can't watch the whole thing they can still read on the screen whereas if you only had an audio they would likely not click on it so mm -hmm. podcasts are really good for people who already are podcast listeners right that's one. The other thing is if you already have an audience, you send them the audio and they will make the time to listen to it. And, and they can multitask meanwhile, because it's only audio, they can drive meanwhile or wash the dishes or whatever. But uh, just for, for building a bigger platform, it's really useful to have the video component. So I have learned that what I'm doing now with my video, so I've, I've been blogging probably properly for about 12 months now. And the what I've realized is with my YouTube videos, they're connected to my topics that my blogs are about. So for example, if I have written a blog about um, how to update your LinkedIn profile, and then I have a short three minute video that shows you how to do something on your LinkedIn profile, I am now embedding the link from YouTube into the blog and I've noted the traffic increase to my website has shot up. It's gone up like 70% just I in the last month. Yeah, okay. so it, it's exactly what you're saying. Um, and yet people still have this fear of video. Like you and I are, are live on video right now. Um, the LinkedIn StreamYard link auto captions us, which is brilliant. Um, it's always very interesting to see what where it picks up my accent and with your accent, who knows what? Thanks for us, Esther. It's a strange alien language. <laughs> Um, but you know, yesterday I was doing a workshop with um, some corporate clients and I, I said to them, what I think would work really, really well is if you, one of, one of the guys in the team, I said, if you did a, you know, a 30 second video about why people should go and check out this new product that you're launching and the faces of the people on the screen were like, ooh, not sure about that. Um, so what would you say to people who, Ha, like, do you have clients that come to you who have a who you kind of need to help them get over the fear of video? Well, okay, so I, I have two answers for that. The one is first one is short. Get over it. Get over yourself <laughs> because you're just gonna need it. <laughs> but the, I do have a lot of compassion for it because I remember one of the very first group coaching programs that I participated in back mm -hmm. 2000. 12 maybe or 11 like really a long time ago it was audio only but we had these live group calls and and it was not even business related it was something about health and um i wanted to learn more but it was so interesting in the q a section no but when it was time to ask questions nobody wanted to ask because there was a shyness like i don't know who these people are like do i dare to speak up like they, like you they shrink into this tiny little person and and i and remember how it felt and maybe it's a little bit different now just because of practice and because we use media or we use video in general a lot more a lot more even as consumers so over the last nine years ten years we've come a long way i remember when youtube first came out and i thought what a stupid thing like who would oh, set up with to watch videos online like and of course it was not on your phone at the time but still it's like why what am i supposed to why would i not do that but but now it's like you, you really got to prioritize like what do I actually want so if you're with corporate clients and as an example they are inside an organization but still if they are not putting themselves forward and they're not doing the presentations and asking for the raise and all of that stuff then how are they going to advance how are they going to get those promotions and so having the their personal brand built within the organization and speaking up and using video and putting their content out there is, is something that will get them seen. And I'm sure that there will be people who are small minded and they'll gossip and they'll say that, well, you didn't have your hair right or whatever. You know what? At least you did it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And um, Narcissus says he's guilty. 
There are other people watching us and they're not even commenting because they don't want their name up on the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's because uh, I have worked with now I, at the minute what I do with people is I do LinkedIn training and I do LinkedIn done for you services but in the past I have run like group programs where it's kind of get yourself online and, and there's lots of different ways of you know, tools that you need to be doing and when when it came to the video part you know if you can go live on Facebook or you can go like do a little video on your Instagram stories and people and you kind of wanted to say to them get over yourself but you can't really say that. You have I, to say I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage them. But what I always said to um, my clients was, the thing is, I'm just looking at a camera right now. I mean, there's people watching me, but all, all there is in this room is me and a camera, and nothing's going to come out of that camera that's going to hurt me. So mm -hmm. think of it that way. Maybe it makes it a little bit easier. Um I did I did get into a newspaper once in the UK and it's one of the tabloid papers, Esther. And the best advice I was given was do not read the comments on the online section of the newspaper mm -hmm. um, about the piece that you appear in because the people who write the comments in those um are not kind. So I never read the comments and I'm mm -hmm. so glad. I don't, so I don't know what they ever said about me. <laughs> you know what? It's it's funny. Like people can be vicious sometimes. It also depends a little bit on what the publication is, right? Because like, as an example, if you're in Forbes or Success Magazine or something, typically people who read those publications are very positive minded and encouraging. Whereas if you read, okay, I don't want to pinpoint any particular, but like a more mainstream <laughs> publication, it's going to be the average person on the street. And so they'll say whatever they want to spew about. So it's really not relevant to you and how you present yourself it's it's yes. really on them and, and their reflection and projection but as far as you know like being comfortable on camera it's i i read somewhere i heard somewhere that like looking directly into the camera sometimes can feel or initially can feel intimidating because yeah. subconsciously it just feels as though an eye is watching you right like and and like back in the day like tigers were watching us and pouncing and so it's oh, it's wow. like, feeling of the predator being like imagine if like let's say you're you're traveling somewhere and you're sitting on a plane and somebody across the aisle is just like <laughs> it's, it's it's really it's something that is very disheartening it's like what's going on like it makes you uncomfortable is yeah. they didn't do anything maybe they're thinking maybe they're like totally spaced out and it has yeah. nothing to do with you but just the the act of somebody locking their eyes on you and yeah and not having any emotional feedback. I think that's part of it too, because a camera doesn't actually mimic anything and it, does, it doesn't behave like a human. So I remember when I first started making videos for content, it was very hard for me, even though I have a background in acting and I was used to it. But with acting, you're speaking pre-written lines and you're interacting with other people. So you, and you're not supposed to look at the camera anyway. <laughs> you're looking yeah. at it, <laughs> right? Like it's very rare that you're actually speaking to the camera in a movie. Yeah. But when you're creating content, you have you have to look at the camera and mm -hmm. so what uh, I found that was very easy for me is the Facebook live type of setup because I would just take out my little phone and talk to it but then I would see my friends commenting on it or people who like my page commenting mm -hmm. on it and it was basically having a conversation yeah. and then also I would see myself it's kind of like looking in the mirror and talking to yourself so that that's kind of that could be something that's a good entryway to practice and if you want you can you know make them where you have the custom settings so it doesn't actually go out public you're just practicing but using that live feature anything that you can do to get yourself comfortable will yeah. only help you yeah no that's that's such good advice all right esther we are going to wrap it up and um, because narcissus was very brave thank you narcissus and joined us with his thank questions and um, everyone else is just watching us while they work <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to check out the podcast with esther it is over on my website and um, under amplify your brands out today um, go and check it out. And for Esther's website, go to borntoinfluence.com. I do believe you have a quiz on the homepage, Esther. Yes, yes. You can take a quiz to figure out whether or not publicity is right for you. Just kind of what we were talking about with uh, Narcissus earlier. Are you at the stage where it makes sense? And it's yeah. not just income-based. There's a couple of other things. So it's a really fun quiz. It's 12 questions, very easy to answer. And it will give you the direction of, based on your answers, what makes the most sense for you. Super. I love a good quiz. I mean, I'm a bit of a quiz fiend. Sounds good. 
Esther, thank you so much for joining me today. And thanks everybody who was watching and anyone in the watching the replay. You can still tag us below and ask questions and we'll I'll come back and check on those later on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.